So I'm going to let uh, uh, Chris do the introductions and sort of frame out what uh, our four main panelists are going to talk about. But he had asked me as a way to get started to say a few general words about the notion of standards and how standards operate, et cetera. And so I'll do that just to, just to get us started a little bit. Um, a standards process, one of the things that, um, that I sort of rankles me a little bit every now and then when people talk about creating standards, because there is a way to do it that is recognizable and that is uh, seen as being useful. And that is uh, a process of identification and shaking out the standards and then uh, creating uh, some sort of a review process. I mean, there's a whole number of things that go into it. Uh, loosely term, loosely used, the term standards really just simply refers to guidelines or, or framework. And uh, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about the difference between a real standards process and uh, a looser standards process that really looks for simply guidelines or, or frameworks. If you're looking for standards work in online dispute resolution, um, there's a good bit going on. Um, the Bar, American Bar Association is uh, in the middle of a process to set some standards for, or at least some guidelines for ODR. Uh, Chris has been involved in that very directly. The International Mediation Institute has established guidelines and standards for online mediators that they use for certification. Um, National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, who's sponsoring this webinar that we're doing today, uh, has published standards. The International Council for Online Dispute Resolution has published a set of, of standards or guidelines. And ISO is working on a set of guidelines and standards for real standards for e-commerce. And Colin Rule, if he joins us, is involved in that process. Um, I'd say there are two or three barriers that I would just highlight, and maybe you guys can talk about these as you go through what you're, uh, what you're gonna discuss. Um, the, one of the first barriers in creating standards is knowing what you're creating standards for. Uh, and for online dispute resolution, that's an interesting question because the definition of online dispute resolution is itself in some dispute. Um, there are people who are on the, uh, the far left end, let's say the liberal end, who would say that any use of any technology for any kind of function in any dispute resolution would be in the ODR tent. And there are people on the other end who would say, no, what we're really talking about is the use of technology to sort of do a cradle to grave end to end process online uh, in a dispute resolution environment. So when we start talking about what are the standards, we just start talking about what, what we're making standards for. Are we making standards for the practitioner, for the provider, for the, for the uh, developer? You know, and, and what are we looking at in terms of process there? The second barrier would be thinking about standards in terms of workability instead of enforceability. Uh, the best standards, the, the most uh, commonly used standards that are out there actually are not enforceable in the strict sense of the word. They are used because people find that they work and that they do what they're supposed to do. And so they're honored as a result of that. And so that is a, a barrier. Maybe think of it as a barrier, but maybe think of it as a, a, a hurdle that one has to get over if you're creating standards that are actually going to stand the test of time. And finally, getting agreement among people who know what they're talking about in any given area is itself an issue. And I would point to the ABA's two-year-long process that we're in the middle of now, Chris, as uh, evidence that that might not be the easiest thing to do. Finding a place to house the standards. And who's going to be the, uh, uh, who or what is going to be the place where those standards live and uh, are uh, administered. And finally, managing them. How do you manage and, and what's the result if you, uh, if you actually violate the standards? So I would just offer all of that as kind of a framework, a background framework to the notion of standards in the first place. And I know that you guys have some very specific things that you want to talk about in relation to those things and, and others. So Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you would do the introductions and kick us off and get us started. You know, Dan, thank you very, very much, because I know it does feel in some of these processes like we're, we're going on these, you know, multi-year hamster wheels in some ways. And so one, one of the, the, the keys to that, though, is really understand that point that you make on workability. Um, what, when we're looking at these standards, do they actually mean when we truly actually run them? And what we've tried to do today is assemble a panel to kick off discussion where those are in the room, please feel free to ask you know, questions. We are, we are talking about here, we've been very fortunate to assemble 
uh, you know, some very top level experts in their area of field, which I'll let them sort of explain what they're focused on as part of their hot take. But where I wanted to start was um, we're, we're talking about trans, you know, transparency, repeatability, and audibility are three of the components that we come up a lot within our standards efforts, come up very much as we start integrating pieces of technology into legal processes, especially into ODR processes. But something that we've always, in some ways, not necessarily beat around the bush, but not really hit on the head as well as we should is, what do these actually mean when we're actually implementing them? You know, what, what does transparency truly mean in a technology system, especially one where the right to privacy also is pretty mandatory, right? What does, you know, what, what does something of repeatability mean when we're dealing with things where having the exact same outcome every time is probably not appropriate? Uh, or you know, what, 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 is, what is auditability? When again, we have confidentiality issues, we have privacy issues, what, what level of auditability is truly possible and practical? So what I want to present or what I want to show here really quickly is uh, Dan alluded to an effort that has been going on, you know, driven by the American Bar Association and uh, Pew. So the, the approach that's been taken so far with these definitions, you know, and again, there, there's no agreement on these after multiple years, but when, when we're looking at transparency, one, one way, one market to potentially throw out here is, you know, we, we really looked at transparency from three sort of levels. And the question is, are, you know, are, are these even possible, right? Our, our, our first source of transparency, you know, in, in general, you know, the sources and methods used to gather any data that influences any decision, maybe an ODR process must be disclosed to all effective parties. What's that truly mean when we're actually dealing with tech? When we're dealing with the AI systems that Lauren's typically dealing with, what does it mean to actually reveal all your sources? Is that even possible? You get into the, the, the DAOs that Ross is dealing with. Can we do that? And if we can, what, what does that truly look like? Uh, automation transparency, right? Um, this, when we get into AI, we're really starting to push boundaries of, again, is this possible in how we think of the tool? Is that tool going to be even able to be used if this is a standard that's appropriate? So here we're saying, you know, the, the systems or processes that use machine learning and or their artificial intelligence must require vendors publicly affirm their compliance, the governmental guidelines on transparency and fairness of AI systems. Is, is that a meaningful statement? Does it do anything? Um, is, is it practical? What, what happens? Who houses it? Um, automation, transparency, decision automation when we're looking at e-commerce side of the house and we're looking at filtering based processes where we say, okay, here's my event, eBay, I got the wrong product. There's really only four bins I can actually go into. How do I actually track that ability to see which, which bin I go into, right? That, that issue of automating, you know, the, the, here we are saying the ODR system designers, implementers, practitioners must clearly disclose the role and magnitude and influence decision-making technology or technologies as assist in human artificial decision makers, having the restricting or generating options or final decisions or outcomes reached by an ODR system. Meaning in a lot of our technologies, we're focusing on how do we reduce human involvement to say, okay, we've now gotten down to a point where I can make my decision easier because I have limited choices. That's what our technology is fundamentally doing, taking away all of the flexibility that we, we find problematic sometimes in our, in our systems. How do we make it transparent how it does that? Is this something that's useful? Um, repeatability. How we've been approaching repeatability over the past few years is one of really consistency in some ways. You know, here, how we were looking at this is ODR system designers, practitioners, and implementers must analyze, understand, and communicate the likelihood that identical data inputs will produce the same informational outputs for two similar cases. Is that something we can do? Can, can, you know, here we're basically saying we're, we're punting on the idea of whether or not everything should be exact. We're basically saying you just have to quantify how exact it is. What does that look like, right? When, when you look at AI systems that are training, how long does it take before you can even prove consistency? And next, you know, do we want consistency? Is it consistency of output or of process? These are the types of issues as we start to dive into repeatability that you know, how should we be even framing the question in a lot of ways? The last one being we're talking about auditability. Same issue of 
the confidence level at which the data processes their outputs that is ingested, employed, or created by an ODR system or any of its components can be identified, validated, or rep replicated during any system audit must be known and accessible to any ODR system operator or user. In here again, similar to repeatability, we're saying, okay, we, 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 don't, we don't know what level of audibility is possible, right? As we're starting to look at, uh, as we're starting to look at DAOs, we're starting to look at it, machine learning and AI, these types of items, can we even audit them? These are some of the big, big important practical concerns that we're hoping to, to dive into a little bit today as we're getting to these sort of key fundamentals of in traditional non-technology ODR, we can say, all right, I had the piece of paper. I knew who was in the room. We talked to each other. I've got sort of, you know, this, this, this brain is working here with no extra support. This one's working here, no extra support. I know that nothing left the room. I can audit the ability of the paperwork that's made or destroyed. As we start adding new technology into that system, the big question is, when we start looking at these pieces of transparency, repeatability, and audibility, what are those major concerns we should be looking at? What are the things in this, this recent time when we were forced into a fully distributed digital world surprised us? And as we're building these systems that will hopefully be either uh, integrating into the, the legal system or more appropriately, transparently and fairly in an audible manner, integrating into the much bigger systems that are embedded in our daily lives, like, again, the insurance industry, where the starting point for many of our civil judicial matters, civil justice matters, are set. What should we be expecting from these tools and how should we be approaching them? So with that, we're going to hear from uh, Lauren and Ali and then Ross uh, with sort of their, their initial take on how they, in their different areas, uh, approach uh, these three key components that, that are important in developing or approaching any uh, standards effort. So uh, I'll stop sharing here with that. You know, Lauren, please, if you're willing to share your first, first thoughts. Sure, so um, really coming from like a technology perspective, when I'm thinking about, um, you know, more so the process by which we're developing solutions that are being used in different um, contexts and in different industries and for different purposes. The idea of having standards is really complicated from a technical perspective because as technologists, as scientists, we're really trained in this scientific method um, that is a bit more open than standards really allow. A lot of times when I'm thinking about, um, you know, how can we actually achieve some level of transparency, accountability, auditability in AI solutions, the, the parallel that um, I think about, especially as an engineer, is like in civil engineering. In civil engineering, they're used to having standards because the bridge can't fall, right? And standards guide the process by which we can measure and assess specific performance metrics. So like, of course, the bridge can't fall, but that also means that the nut and the bolt have to be able to sustain, sustain a certain, you know, um, amount of stress or a certain amount of weight. And those standards drive in, in the sub pieces really drive how we would design a specific physical infrastructure solution. So one of the things that is challenging when we're thinking about AI, when we're thinking about using data in all of these systems is that we don't always have a good process by which we examine the, um, the reliability, the, um, even the, the accuracy of individual components. So um, kind of like what Chris was alluding to, especially when we're using all these online systems, a lot of times we're not attentive to as individuals, as even expert users are not attentive to the many different ways that we are offering up lots of itty bitty pieces of data that can be used in any different um, set of ways. And I think it's, um, you know, one of the challenges for technologists um, comes from the fact that when we're developing a solution, um, especially an AI solution, almost any data is treated as good data. That's not true, but it's treated that way. And that, and that also doesn't require that, um, that we have a strong understanding of like the ground truth of a certain data set, that we have a strong um, 
awareness of the contextual appropriateness of a, of a data set, um, you know, the more data kind of the better can is often viewed as um, a good thing, basically. So one of the challenges, um, at least when we're thinking about on, from the technology side, again, on all of these issues is, you know, do the, do the folks who are developing systems actually have the contextual expertise to make a judgment about the, the quality, the reliability, again, of those nuts and bolts? And if we don't, then how do we achieve that? So that's like through interdisciplinary partnership, it's through collaboration, but often there's this tension of speed and, and also literacy on both um, the technical side and, the, and the, um, the context in which a technology is applied. Folks aren't speaking the same languages. We don't necessarily understand each other well, and that causes issues um, to be able to even, again, check for like the appropriateness of specific um, data sets, specific pieces of data, and how that might be used. Um, when I'm thinking about standards, I think it was really interesting. Um, this summer, NIST came out with a request for input on AI standards. And it's really, it really was a very broad, um, generic call, but they offered a set of um, ideas around how we might address fairness, how we might address, um, you know, bias in a broad set of context, use cases, and that sort of thing. And I think it's a, a worthwhile challenge, but I don't know how, um, how likely it is to ensure that people are, are working up to a specific standard. Dan, um, some of the things that Dan was saying in the beginning made me think about how, um, you know, especially in the AI and technology data science space, things are very democratic. Anyone gets to jump in you don't need to have a driver's license to develop a model and put it out into the wild. In, in reality, you don't, you don't need a driver's license to hop in a car and drive it somewhere. But if you get caught, you have a problem, right? Um, and we don't, until there's like some sort of driver's license for um, AI solutions, especially those that are high risk, um, especially those that have a significant impact on people's lives, do we have a way for those standards to actually even be, um, for people to be accountable to those standards? Um, I don't, even in this kind of, in this moment where, you know, we have the, the Facebook papers and all this other stuff, um, there's not even, I don't think enough of a um, public accountability or outcry for accountability. And that's something that, um, you know, do we do we want accountability? Do we want um, technologists, technology, technology companies to be accountable? Because that might mean some of the things we want are not possible. So I don't. I, I covered a whole bunch of different things, but those are just some of my initial thoughts that I wanted to offer out to the group from a technology perspective. Well, and jumping over to Ali, one of the things for, for those on here who may not always be in a technological space, but one of the things you identified very, you know, that, that I think is an important one is, you know, we know that we don't want the bridge to fail. And because we know that we don't want the bridge to fail, we know that the nut must withstand certain forces, must withstand certain items. We, we do know a standard of performance there. One of our arguments, and please Ali, either continue to go a completely different track where your first take is, when you, when you enter a room of mediators and have 100 mediators, you have 487 different ways of mediating that change every three minutes. So if, if the nut's never the same, what, what, what do we do? And can we actually get there until we sort of know that either this is a process or not? And you know, so, so, uh, Ali, apologies not to, not to take a different way, but I love that perspective of the nut. And hopefully, you know, as I say, you know, a lot of Ross's pieces, I'm assuming you'll touch on this too, but please, Ali, Ali what, are you, what are your first thoughts? You've uh, you've sent my brain whirring with that little uh, with that little metaphor there. Um, I, I'm I'm afraid I'm not the most qualified to be able to bring an answer to that. But I'm really looking forward to. Um, I think Ross is going to speak on that later. But I think from my perspective, just to give a little background, so I'm I'm probably the most or well, the least technologically literate uh, in this esteemed room at the moment, um, having come late to this meeting because my video wasn't working on my laptop. Um, 
but uh, nonetheless, my, my interest in uh, essentially the future of justice comes from uh, the background of all the different, I guess, human things I've done, including uh, training as a barrister, uh, working as solicitor for those um, who are seeing daylight, uh, who aren't seeing daylight behind me. That's because I'm in the UK where there's a split between the bar and the solicitor world, uh, but in litigation in general. And uh, I, I now sort of look at this from a sort of North Star perspective, rather than uh, looking at things in the nitty gritty of all this incredible stuff that people are doing on the ground with regards to data and with regards to AI and machine learning. Um, I try and couple that with the experience that we've seen across the world in terms of the evolution of the concept of justice in general, um, without it going too far down the philosophical route. And I think when we talk about standards, uh, I think it's worth also talking about expectations, right? So um, the exciting world that we live in now with, you know, not just the development of what one can do with you know, Web 2.0, but indeed with blockchain, et cetera, in terms of opening our minds out to representing a brand new ecosystem of humanity within which justice can exist, sometimes tempts us to go way, way beyond, I guess, needs or expectations with regards to what kind of legal world and process we're building. On a tangible note, it means, for example, that we need to ask the question, are we trying to represent our extant legal models in a virtual way, or are we trying to create, honestly, new virtual legal models, right? And that's an extremely important thing to sit with and, and ascertain before we go too far down the line. The temptation, I guess, for the latter is that we've seen time and time again that the former has proven itself to you know, be full of bias, been full of all sorts of human error, and by nature of history, it is the product, not of justice as much as it is the product of power, right? And when we talk about decentralization, what we're actually talking about is the dis dissolution of centralized power of one form or another. Now, the, when it comes to saying, okay, practically, how do we create standards for transparency or accountability uh, so, or, or repeatability or auditability in the space that we have at the moment, especially since COVID, what COVID has done is actually force us all to actually, in the space, reflect what actually exists in an online manner. So even the slowest of jurisdictions, and I'd count the one that I'm sitting in right now, England and Wales, um, when, uh, when, they, when they're now thinking about uh, online dispute resolution, uh, from their perspective, what it is, is a reflection of what already exists, even to the extent that uh, Richard Susskind, who's quite a you know big big name in this field, his response his response to the Briggs report a few uh, years ago, which was you know a, a report from uh, Judiciary about online dispute resolution, even highlighted the concept and the importance of retaining the majesty of the courts in an online fashion. Right. So imagine the UX and the UI of the court system being such a reflection of what already exists. That it isn't the concept of free and open, you know, smart contract style justice. It's literally a virtual representation of already exists, because that's the only way that certain practitioners understand, or indeed the world arguably understands, how justice operates, which is a centralized individual that represents precedence, that represents and through precedence represents repeatability, uh, that represents transparency because of their inherent job or who represents auditability because of their mandate as per being an organ of power of the state. So when we look at these three elements, are we looking to reflect what has existed historically? Or honestly, are we looking at saying, do we look at this a completely different way in order to achieve our own versions of standards that are fitting of the future? My personal opinion is realistically speaking, one has to do the former until reaching a point of parity before technology then ends up defining the latter, right? In other words, sort of using technology to catch up, to get to a stage where, you know, one can expect to, to, to file an online money claim and it going through the process as quick as possible. And then within that ecosystem, AI then digs in and says, okay, we know how judges operate. The machine has learned enough. Now it's a case of saying, do we want to choose democratically or not? 
whether the machine starts developing law past that. So there's my sort of North Star introduction. I guess I'm going to pass on now to somebody who actually is going to go into a little bit more detail about what this stuff actually means. No, I, I love those pieces. And there's a few in there like, you know, precedence is repeatability in some of the ways we think about that right now, which is actually quite interesting. I mean, Richard Susskind is also you know, a fellow of the, of the center, the National Center of Technology and Dispute Resolution here. I mean, it has, has guided a lot of our thinking on that so much, which I, is why in a lot of the things that Ross, that you're, you're doing with DAOs, in some ways can take people from sort of a, a, a mind blown piece, but I think also touches on exactly what you know, Lauren and Ali are getting out of the, the, their core. I don't know if you're willing to provide, again, a, a, a first opening thought of where you sit on this. Oh, sure. Um, and yeah, I thought those were very uh, helpful and thoughtful uh, introductions uh, to the problem space. Um, largely, I, I share the same North Star in that I don't think automation through like Web3 and smart contracts replaces the need for legitimacy. Um, you know, when people, uh, you know, look at the legal system, they want to have remedies that are not only repeatable, but, you know, feel legitimate, um, you know, uh, using a DAO or a smart contract or a virtual judge doesn't replace the psychological need to feel like your uh, claims were heard and that there was a sense of justice. Um, largely, what I look at is consistency, I guess, in process. Um, using a smart contract, it's very predictable that after a, you know, judgment is entered, a, uh, you know, an arbiter makes a signature of their awards that the money will be paid out automatically. Um, and sort of the history of, um, you know, the arbitration will also be transparent because it's on a public blockchain. Um, I do, do think these things can provide sort of context for machine learning. Um, maybe we will see a sort of common law of, you know, AI that studies how, uh, you know, judgments are awarded. Maybe they'll be more sophisticated at looking at the content of judgments, not purely the numbers. Um, but I do think that's uh, pretty far away off. So, um, and to also back it up, you know, I, I think the word DAO gets... Uh, sort of uh, misconstrued sometimes can be confusing. It's basically like, you know, the sense of like chat rooms, people are congregating online, they're coordinating, they're doing business deals, but why not add sort of, um, you know, a bank account or a smart contract to what people are already doing online? Um, that is basically a DAO. It's an organization where you can pull funds together, you can vote and sort of run an online business with, um, you know, public blockchains. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like I'm saying that, there are still um, scalability issues and sort of actually doing the legal process. Um, I'm more of a, I guess, a developer in that I'm looking at how to design smart contracts that are very easy to understand and that have been put into production to do arbitration, which I have done with a couple uh, DAOs uh, within the family circle of uh, people I'm working with. Um, this, in terms of scalability issues, I do think that um, something that I've seen that is necessary is to get a strong community of mediators together that can share notes and sort of coordinate on, you know, what standards are we going to import into sort of our on online, um, you know, hearings. These hearings can be through like Discord, uh, private chat rooms, um, through email. We haven't uh, automated the need for privacy, right? Um, so th that's kind of what I'm doing with a group called LexDAO. It's just getting people who already basically have a code of ethics that can make predictable, legitimate judgments, and then putting them into what I call the beanbag chair of a DAO and saying like, click these buttons. You make your signatures, you uh, you know record uh, kind of the content of your judgment, and then the financial stuff is automated. So I, I think we've accelerated the, the business and process aspects of smart contracts, but we have not um, necessarily removed the need for uh, you know having hearings. Um, something that I really would like to you know go into deeper, and I'm, I'm sure other panelists have a good, a good amount of thought here, is like how do we maintain privacy and sort of um, the sense of traditional legal systems and uh, you know fairness in a completely online setting. Like what, what are those rooms look like? What is the user experience? That, that's more what I'm thinking about. Um, but yeah, no, <laughs> I, I think smart contracts definitely just are more on the financial business side of things. So yeah, that's my, uh, my gist. Well, that is, I mean, that, that yep. is an interesting question, which is one of the, the, the big ones that always is, 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 is big to me. And again, it, for, for everyone, uh, the, there's 28 minutes because Colin has a, has a session after this. So we do have a hard stop and we're ending, but uh, please feel free to ask any questions in, in the chat. And if we, we don't get them, if we don't fully get them, please, we'll, we'll put you on the mic and actually ask it directly. But of the, you know, the, the privacy piece, right? I, I know a lot of the arguments around uh, blockchain and AI data sets and even getting into uh, the, these new distributed environments is, 
there is a certain level of privacy. And I think Ali, you've, you've spoken before but other times with respect to um, like when, when you're looking at the way we look at privacy in America as sort of a, you know, a NASCAR activity, right? It's, it's whoever wants to buy gets to own privacy, whereas it's a fundamental right in other, other, other places. When we're starting to get into transparency and audibility in some of these, these you know, sessions, we, we often talk a lot about you know, anonymity or in some cases a pseudo anonymity, right? Where we say, okay, well, we're gonna obfuscate this to a certain, you know, to a certain point where we say, well, you can't immediately know who that is. When you're looking at the different tools, it, it seems like all three of you are working in systems where obfuscation is a mandatory. At what point is obfuscation sufficient to be able to sit in that balance between, you know, Ross, what you're talking about is I have to make sure I'm repeatedly executing the smart contract correctly. Or on Ali, on your side, we need to figure out how do we actually um, enable a new, almost a, a voting system, similar to what uh, a juror who recently got a lot of headlines for their investment from uh, um, from uh, DFJ uh, because of their use of, of, of Bitcoin in their voting method. Um, and you know, again, in the same thing from from Lauren, from your, from your perspective, I mean. If we, if we, can we really ever not know who the person is, right? So it's that, that MIT situation of it only took 30 days to reproduce 17% of respondents in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in an analysis. And within 60 days, we got to 75%, that rebuilding. As you guys are all looking at from your different perspectives, what level of obfuscation is that level where you're saying, hey, I, I can ensure justice while ensuring privacy? And is that even, I guess, possible? Is there, is there a limit? to some of these some of these tools if i if i may if i may jump again this this looks at um you know when we talk about privacy we talk about who needs to know what and why right now in the traditional sense or let's call let's now now we're calling the legal system the traditional world <laughs> uh in, in the traditional world um you know transparency is achieved supposedly uh, through uh, the con to the idea of being open about the parties that are coming to litigation, the parties or the individuals that are acting as tribunal in a litigation and putting forward the judgment, and uh, or the other stakeholders uh, that are involved. Right. So, um, you know, to to the extent that balance is put to obfuscate for reasons of privacy, things which aren't deemed materially relevant to the actual point of the litigation itself. What is the balance of relevance in that instance? It's saying, okay, well, what is the way in which justice is achieved according to the concept of justice being, um, you know, something that actually, I guess, in this country uh, is based on, you know, values that date back to, I guess, Christian values or Abrahamic values, right? Now, these are very, you know, these are so deeply set into our social fabrics that we don't even really think about them. Um, when you're talking about obfuscating, I think in blockchain, or when we're talking about it from the perspective of any digital system, where we say, okay, we're going to, we want to, you know, be in a world where actually it was completely anonymized, purest justice, and actually we're looking at sort of a series of rules and tests to check whether one party is due something from another. Um, it is in theory possible, right? As in, it's in theory possible in practice. One has to ask, OK, well, is that what individuals in society actually want? Is that what they need in order to maintain some sense of continuity in their day to day life in as stress free a fashion as possible? Um, now, that's a, that's an open question. One way in which I balance that is saying, OK, well, in jurisdictions that I've worked with in the past, which have been blended. Right. So they take, for example, uh, the common law of England and Wales, and yet blend it somehow with the local jurisdictional law, which has a very different value system. So for example, in the United Arab Emirates, in Dubai, you've got something called the Dubai International Finance Center, the DIFC, which operates under common law as a square mile. It's not gated or anything like that. You can drive through it without even knowing. But as an individual, as a human being uh, who's there, who wants to know about their guess daily human rights over there, criminal law, and trust and wills and probate are of the onshore civil, the UAE jurisdiction, right? So it blends the human law, it retains the human law, and then creates a whole different law for commercial, 
tort, etc., which is borrowed from the common law. So systems are existing, which are quite innovative around the world, which do blend one version with another. And one could ask, okay, well, how much of the laws that we have in the world today should be retained as human because that, we're just not very good or it's too scary to go down the road so far that we're living in this sort of you know, Blade Runner-esque environment, but yet still able to say, okay, for commercial law and for tort law and for elements of law that do require and would benefit from quick justice of transactional value, we can actually use the machinery for that. So in a long answer to your question of obfuscation, is it about relevance, not just in terms of the value to the human being, but relevance in terms of the value of the actual case to the, uh, the rest of the jurisdiction as well. I'd have a, a quick note that, um, at least from what I see in the market um, with uh, you know, blockchain arbitration is that you know, the market is thriving with blockchain because there is sort of these privacy guarantees. I think generally that is the preference of many users is to obfuscate who they are, to not have any sort of arbitrary barriers entering the business deal with each other. Um, because we have this sort of peer-to-peer -peer agreement capability that way, we then have the need for a justice system on top of that, that I think also maintains that sort of privacy. Otherwise, people won't want to do sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer business agreements if they know if there's an issue, then we'll have to actually dox ourselves. Dox means uh, de-anonymize, de if I can say the word correctly. Um, however, one issue that I'm noticing though is like in offering sort of on-chain justice, um, arbitration, I think it's very important to be able to figure out conflicts of interest and not being able to you know, properly determine the identity of the parties sometimes I think might raise the issue of conflicts that I'm not sure if there is a good way to ferret out other than my, my sort of approach has been, let's find people who already have some sort of uh, code of ethics, like lawyers who can have our complaints filed against them and sort of have this self-regulation of um, don't enter in, into conflict situations. Um, we can't automate a way that this sort of, you know, the reality that people have bias when they have a business interest in somebody. So um, I think that's probably where the rubber hits the road for me is just like, yeah, like, can we trust the arbiters, even though I think generally um, we're going to see increasing preference for being masked to do business. Um, so that's the problem space as I see it. <laughs> I don't think there's an easy solution here. Lauren, I know, I know, I, know yeah. I just wanted to jump in on that to, to, to sort of jump from Ross's point there. Um, I mean, the whole premise of arbitration traditionally has been this beautiful idea that both parties know what they've sort of bought into, right? As in both parties have chosen to, to go into it with a set of rules and hey, if it didn't work out for you, tough luck, right? Now, it's a very different thing when uh, you don't feel you have the literacy or the acumen to understand what it is you just signed up for, right? And that's a big issue. So, you know, there are already there are already sort of rules in, you know, for example, in the UK, there are civil practitioner rules, criminal practitioner rules, huge books that break your arms trying to carry around on a daily basis um, that literally are the code, so to speak. Right. They are the developer's code that anyone can access to go and see how the legal system works. Right. That is the equivalent of saying, here's transparency. Look, it's, it's up to you. If you want to see how transparent the system is, here's the code for it, right? The difference is that it, you often take about three or four years of studying to get anywhere close to understanding how that code works. The idea that online can make it any easier, um, it seems to me to be a bit of a fallacy because I, you know, I've tried four years to understand Python and I'm no closer to it than I was four years ago, right? So, so, so therein lies the rub. At the end of the day, it's about not just the capacity to say, look, here you go, here's all the, the code, and therefore it's transparent. But without the sense of literacy or acumen within the consumer space, it's just the same problem in a different format. Yeah, I think I would add to that too, just thinking about like, um, Ali, what you brought up about like the histories of specific um, activities or how, and also the relationship of power because it's incredibly important and it really ties back to your last point too around you know do people have the acumen to engage in these things because they've been simplified for digestible purposes um, you know a lot of I think that you know if we really examine you know the power relationships and the histories around 
any sort of judicial engagement in systems, there's there are also archetypes of people, and those archetypes have also are easy to connect to stereotypes, which means that certain people get certain kinds of justice in certain ways, and then that the idea of obfuscating that individual or concealing the individual when when people need justice, when people need rights, their individual selves have to be heard, seen, and recognized. And if we, you know, entirely, um, you know, if, if this entire process is made into an opaque box, then that individual can't ever have a sense of, of actually, you know, receiving justice or, or even just being treated fairly in some, in whatever version of, um, of the world that that particular solution might live in. When you're looking at these, like as, as you're looking at them and start, I had like 53 questions before that and Lauren touched on like 86 of them. But like, when we're looking at that though, like what, what is justice in these cases as you're looking at them? Like, I mean, like, like, like Ross, for example, what is your perception of justice if the system works? Because that's, that's part of my, all of most people here are going to be ODR practitioners. There is a, within the NCTDR week, the cyber week here, a lot of how we, we look at this is, you know, these are, how do we have better ways that humans can solve human problems? And now as we move into ODR, we're now trying to debate how far removed do we take the human from solving these human problems again. I guess what it opens the door a little bit to, to me is like, what, what is justice in your case, Ross, as you're looking at your system? What's justice? And I guess, you know, Lauren Raleigh, how, how do you view it as well? I would say justice is finality, um, which can be extreme in some cases. Like there is a uh, philosophy among a lot of blockchain coders and users that code is law, that once a smart contract um, you know, changes its state, it changes the uh, balances of accounts, it spits a token out, that's the final word. And that you know, philosophy comes from this notion that these are immutable transactions that are very, very hard to reverse, even if a government wanted to uh, try to apply its own jurisdiction here, it would be um, immensely difficult at this stage. Um, however, that's not exactly, uh, you know, justice per se, you know, finality can't be the whole story. So kind of when I look at these systems that are being designed to sort of approximate like legal systems using smart contracts and basically keeping the market entirely um, online is, can you at least avoid the impression of um, arbitrariness? Can you provide feedback to users that indicate that they were fairly heard, that a person you know, with a beating heart understood their, their claims um, and gave it some sort of due uh, course of thought and process. So um, yeah, I think justice, you know, we, we have the sense of process that the process you apply to one user should be the same as another, um, you know, both in sort of the legal sense of like hearing claims and uh, you know, documenting decisions. Um, and also, yeah, in, in sort of the enforcement of those decisions, which I think the, the latter is a lot easier because that's actually completely automated. So judgment awards can't be um, capriciously withheld by a judge, you know, after it's entered. The smart contract immediately uh, changes uh, state and gives users uh, the award. So um, because we have uh, such a superpower at the back end, I think it's uh, almost more important to really stress this idea of like giving people a sense of fairness so that there is true finality, even though a user can't necessarily undo a blockchain transaction, they can still try to um, overturn and try to get a remedy, um, you know, attack it off chain, if you will. Um, so providing the finality, I think, has to appeal to traditional legal systems and say, like, we followed the, the basic notions of fairness here. Um, we followed a standard, you know, AAA or uh, UN standards for arbitration. And then we kept justice, but then it's going to be much quicker because people can enter into business deals and know that there's finality that's very quick. Um, so. I think that's probably um, in my mind how it should be and not entirely dystopian, <laughs> you know, not just like any machine justice system, right? So I think we're, we're pretty close. So in, in, that, in that case, in, sorry, Lauren, I saw you, you know, <laughs> for something here, but like in, in, in that case, do you view, am I interpreting correctly that the finality can never be overturned? So if we have a final, it's like, this is the final, this is a permanent, and so the, the, the logic would be if the system was broken or if a dispute of, of how that process occurred 
we're saying that you know that there's a new process that corrects the finality or the previous justice then as opposed to an alternative is is, is that what i'm understanding or did i miss that correct so once a transaction is entered onto the blockchain, you'd have to convince the people that run the software and validate transactions to basically fork and reverse it. And that is extremely controversial. Um, there was a hack um, a couple of years ago that caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to somebody. And that group that had that, those damages, you know, did everything they could to convince the Ethereum community um, and the people that are mining the transactions to do a hard fork and change that transaction. But even that amount of money wasn't enough to get people convinced that it was worth it to disrupt the uh, norms of the market, which is everything's final. I, I still think that, you know, if you have a transaction, you know, maybe it's a mistake or somebody feels like it wasn't fairly entered, they can still say, judge, I want a remedy. You know, I, I want to garnish this person's wages. I, I, I want um, my damages entered into a court. And so they can attack it that way, even though you, you have finality in the jurisdiction of the blockchain. So th that's how a legal system can sort of attack the legal system of the chain, I, I would say. Very, very hard to reverse things, so. Yeah. Can I ask an off the wall question? I think it's an off the wall question. Um, your conversation, <laughs> Chris is laughing because he knows it will be an off the wall question. Um, you, you've been talking, uh, all of you, about <clears throat> the automating systems, talking about what the definition of justice is and fairness and all of that. Um, the assumption seems to be that we're moving in the direction of finding ways to use AI, machine learning, and other kinds of tools to automate justice in some way. And my question sort of backs away about half a step from that and asks, is there anything we ought not be messing with? Is there anything we ought not think about automating and we ought not think about applying these tools to? Uh, uh, in my opinion, yes, an awful lot, but I think you might have expected that. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I look, tying that uh, the answer to that in with the question that Chris asked as well, there are four particular terms that come up again and again when you're when you're when you're operating in a in a common law jurisdiction. Fair, just, reasonable, proportionate, right? These four are at the core of the heart of our justice system in you know, the Western world, and frankly, further beyond as well. Um, they allow us to be able to bring some semblance of logical step-by-step -step, um, you know, approach to incredibly complicated issues of life, right? Um, and so in looking at what those four individually um, sort of have in terms of the definition of justice, the definition of fairness, it's all about the context. So the, and again, to tie into to what you were saying, what do we, what can't we lose? We can't lose sight of the fact that what happens when you're a human being in court, in the position of an arbiter or a tribunal is, yes, you are trying to control your emotion, but what you are actually using often beyond what most average people do is your empathy. You are using contextual empathy to be able to get as much of an image of a particular circumstance or situation before then applying the beauty and benefit of logic to find a position which is a codified way of finding a resolution, right? You lose the empathy and you start to find ways of making quick decisions in a very inhumane fashion, right? So when we're talking about AI and we're talking about machine learning, it is very good at catching up to our logic but we ourselves aren't very good at understanding our empathy right now, right? So I think we need to be slightly wary of deferring or fettering too much of our responsibility to the machinery before we fully understand what it is that we are doing in court and why, right? So with the definition of fairness, I'd say that it is, it's a subjective thing. It's about emotional balance. Justice is the same, but objective, right? What's interesting is that if you look at reasonableness, how can you define what is reasonable? Historically, what has happened in England, I don't know whether, you, uh, you know, there is an equivalence in, in the States about this. It's quite interesting. But in England, there's something called the, the man on the Clapham omnibus, right? And basically, the way that they, the court defines the idea of what is deemed reasonable is what a guy who is taking a bus, the 62 or whatever, down Clapham High Road would think is reasonable in a situation. 
So it creates a an, sort of an arbitrary median line by which it's defined to be reasonable. The issues we can look at there are, well, what if you happen to be a woman on the Croydon tram? What if you happen to be, you know, uh, somebody else in on the Glasgow um, metro, right? So we can use technology to start to open up arenas of justice a little bit more, so long as we're not challenging the core premise of the role that empathy plays in our entire sense of justice and how we manage problem solving a very chaotic world into some manner of order. And that issue of empathy, I guess, Lauren, because there's, there's a lot of things that we've done and explored where that issue of empathy is in, attempting in some ways to be reflected in how we're approaching the data management, the data, all those pieces. I guess, how, how do you, that, and I'm sorry for not having a clear question because I love that the point I heard was that empathy is such a key fundamental element underlying those other standards that there, there, there must be a way we, we deal with it. I know we only have seven minutes. So we can't like jump into a ton of stuff. I mean, how do you see empathy in the data sets you're dealing with or the, or the way that we clean them, knowing that like these, these data sets very similar are not going to have all the context in the same way a judge won't or the Clapham tram or it's an orange donuts in Glasgow. You can, if you fall asleep, you get back to where you're going again. But you know, how do you see empathy how, how do you see empathy as, as, as a trajectory for the, the problems you're facing or, or do you or how do you or do you see it differently? So I, the empathy piece is really important because even, you know, I kind of just like sketched a little thought experiment. If we're focused on reasonableness, that's societally informed and that still relies on some version of empathy. But that societally informed piece is problematic because the way that who we are in society impacts how we view what is reasonable. I might assume that certain things are reasonable because I grew up in a certain area, because I am used to a certain environment, I am used to certain things, um, and and that doesn't necessarily always translate to um, empathy doesn't translate well to systems. It doesn't translate well to data. Um, there's a really great report out from the Urban Institute um, where they're talking about empathy in, um, in, in data practices, primarily in just how we might um, essentially identify or loosely identify people with, within data sets and how to do that with some, some level of empathy. I think that there's a lot of methods that are becoming more, um, more widely considered so like, you know, having more participatory sorts of research approaches. I've been down this whole thought experiment around restructuring the epistemologies that we put around the data that goes into the AI system and how many different epistemologies actually matter to be able to do that. But it, for me, it kind of comes down to if you can give me a definition of justice that's in a binary code, I can give you a line of code that will give you an answer to that. But, but we can't, we're not able to do that. So, you know, kind of also going back to Dan's question, we can't just throw high risk, you know, we can't throw AI or machine learning or data science at high risk issues and not include people in the process. Because, you know, I think that there are even, um, especially in high risk situations, and, and we can also like debate about what counts as high risk. Um, but when we're thinking about a high risk situation, I don't want, you know, the decisions that, um, you know, affect people's human, functional human rights to be up to a machine that, you know, some person decided behind that machine what counts as justice in that situation. So I think that we have to um, be more in a, in a brief way, we have to be incredibly mindful about the ways in which we might leverage technology to advance justice oriented work because we have to be attentive to a lot more things if, if that's our goal. That's, that's almost the perfect opening to a third rail and I know that we in the ODR community because a lot of and I know we only have three three minutes left so I guess my hope is to each of you say hey what's a one example of something that we should not be using technology for even though we could because to, to Lauren's exact point one of the things we keep saying in the sort of our court trials is 
this is a low, you know, th this is a low cost case, not a big deal, right? What is low cost case, right? I broke my finger the other year and it cost $550 before noon on a Saturday morning for this thing. That is for the, for everyone across the street from me, that is their mortgage. And that, that, that is their rent that month, right? It's their mortgage if they're lucky enough to have a house, which less than 2% of those in my neighborhood are, right? These are situations where low cost is fundamentally different to each other's. So how do we actually, and I, to, to Claudia's point that she's saying in the chat as well, right? Who is defining that low risk, low cost, which is important? So as, as we're looking at again, with you know only two minutes left, I mean I don't know. We'll we'll start with Ross and work backwards. I mean, what is what is one thing within here that the technology could do it, but it shouldn't? Uh, wow, <laughs> I mean that that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, it probably I would I would just echo what we discussed that the uh, you know the notion of judgment really. Um, we can see in contract law cases that um, machines can make errors because sometimes parties and goods services have names that are confusing. I think the peerless ship case was one of the, the most hilarious examples of mistake in contract where a ship that was literally called peerless was mistaken for another. So I think we can see how machines will be able to understand context. They'll be able to, in a split second, understand the parties, the claims, and apply it to maybe a case history. But I still think it's such a such a, it, it takes a, an element of a absurdity to understand the human condition. And I don't think machines will get there. And if they do, then we have an entirely different problem than like automating justice. Cause then the machines are like are in charge, you know? So like, I, I don't think they'll get there and maybe we don't want them to get there. We don't want them to have the capabilities of judgment and understanding us that intimately. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. And also we don't want to automate away the time necessary to understand context and like uh, the other panelists were saying have empathy i think there is a sort of time game in blockchain and a lot of legal tech of like let's just like make markets almost instantaneous let's go uh, you know to hyperspeed um because that's what the market wants but um you can't fully understand and apply empathy if you're in a video game and I think, you know, what I see in DAOs is that we have safeguards where if you make a decision, there's like a two week time period where it can't be executed and sort of slowing things down sort of kicks in our instincts of empathy, allows us to apply our imagination and consider other people and put ourselves in their shoes. So if you're not having a face to face meeting, I think we have to program time, use time as a tool to get people to like apply their instincts. Um, going fast isn't always the best. So. Um, I guess that's my answer, but I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> uh, what are well, the other well, given the fact that we're running up on a hard, uh, hard stop time for another conference, and, and oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Chris. no, no worries. Uh, I think it was a good answer. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for attending, but also thank our four panelists for a, 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 an interesting and uh, thought provoking conversation.